LLM application process and as well as uh, you know how to qualify as a lawyer or what are the steps are taken to qualify as a lawyer in the United States once you are done with your LLM. Uh, Jan, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and uh, I will uh, pass on the presentation, I'll pass on the control o over to you right now so that you can uh, take it forward from there and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to University of Connecticut School of Law uh, webinar today and my name is Yang Hong, Director of Graduate Admissions. My colleague, hi I'm Carrie Field, also um, Director of Exchange and LLM programs. So, uh, welcome to join us and today we're going to talk about specialized LLM programs and bar exam. So I will start with uh, the webinar first and then my colleagues will talk about the bar exams. So as you all know in the United States for US students if they want to become a lawyer then they have to start four-year bachelor degree and probably the United States is the only country in the world without a law degree for bachelor. So if American students want to be a lawyer, they have to do four-year bachelor degree on any subject and then they take LASET, they apply, they get into a JD program, so they go to law school. Usually that's three-year program for 86 credits and for some people who already work full-time, they do part-time for four years. So after they finish law school, they start it for bar and then if they pass the bar, then they can practice the law. And the United States probably is the only country that each state have its own bar exams. So 50 states have 50 uh, bar. For international students, we try to make it easier for international students because you all get a bachelor degree of law. So when you come to the United States, you can choose. You can choose either to take, uh, go to law school, for JD for three years, or you may do an easy way just today to do LM degree. So since you are all here to attend this webinar, I understand that you probably all have a little knowledge about the LM programs. So for LM program, we have um, U.S. legal studies, but we also have specialized programs. That's what we're going to talk about and focus today. But generally speaking, for international students. If you already have a law degree for bachelor, you can come to United States, do 24 credits, get the LM degree, then you prepare for the bar. Once you pass the bar, then you can practice law in the United States. Or a lot of time, people don't really practice law in the United States, but they just want to have this bar um, passed so that they can go home, go to their home country, and practice law. So. A lot of time we always ask our students why you want to study law in the United States. There are so many reasons, but we believe a lot of students come to the United States. They just want to understand, to know a little bit about U.S. legal systems and specialize in particular field. That's what we're going to focus today. For example, we have insurance law, we have energy environmental law, human rights, social justice, intellectual property for IP law. So that's what we specialize here in at our law school. And once you do that 24 credits, you are also qualified to take the bar exams. And uh, that's what a lot of students want to do. They come to United States, they take the bar, and either as I mentioned, you can practice law in the United States or you can just go back to work at the foreign law firms or foreign corporations. Even nowadays, as I understand, a lot of uh, big domestic law firms, they, because they have a lot of foreign business, international business, they want their um, new hired attorneys to have a bar that um, they passed in the foreign countries. And of course, some students come to the United States, they started LLM, and then they would like to work on SJD, and eventually they can teach at, back home at their law schools. So that's all the reasons or part of the reasons people come to the United States and study law. So what specialties do we have at University of Connecticut Law School? I just mentioned we have human rights and social justice. 
We have insurance law. We have energy and environmental law. We have intellectual property and information governance. One question you may want to ask yourself is, why you want to do specialized programs? Because all four programs we have here, uh, we offer also to U.S. students. So for U.S. students, they must have a JD, and some of them already practiced law for many years. They either want to change gear, and, um, or they just want to know more about the special subject. So for example, in recent couple of years, we have U.S. attorneys uh, graduate from Yale, Harvard, all Columbus law schools. They apply our insurance law program, our energy and environmental law programs um, So for the specialized programs. They just want to focus on one of those areas and do more. So question for you, why do you want to do special programs? Of course, first of all, you, it's your personal interest. You're really interested in, for example, insurance law, or you're really interested in IP programs. And also, you may consider the job market. So for example, we have students applying uh, from foreign countries. We have students from Africa who are very much interested in energy and environmental law. And I ask them why they are so interested in this area. And they tell me stories. And they say something about, it's really the country need some people to fo focus on these areas. So I always tell our applicants, when you apply LM programs, make sure, yes, you're personally very much interested in these areas, you like it, and also you want to consider about the job market, because that's the area that you want to focus, and then you want to use it. You want to use the skill you learned at the law schools. So at the Yukon School of Law, for all the speci uh, specialized LM programs, 24 credits for international students, you can finish 24 credits in two semesters, or you can finish in three semesters. Two required courses for all international students, that's the basic US legal institutions, US legal institutions, legal writing, and uh, research. And then you need to choose six courses that's related to the subject you choose. So for example, insurance law. You need to choose six courses that are related to insurance law. And then at the end of the semester, or actually the second semester or the third semester, you need to finish a paper or thesis. And for that, that writing requirement has to be related to the subject that you choose. So if you choose energy and environmental law, you need to write a paper on energy and environmental law. Hi, so this is Carrie again, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how to combine one of these specialized degrees with also the requirements to take a bar exam in the United States. So what is what we are finding that students are opting for is rather than study generic US law, they find that the specialized degree will be more important to them in their home country or wherever they choose to practice in the future. However, they also have a goal of being able to sit for and take a bar in one of the states. And so for that reason, we're going to talk a little bit about the bar requirements in the United States. As Yen previously mentioned, one of the unique things about law in the United States is we have 50 states and 50 different rules for foreign attorneys in terms of how and how they could qualify to sit for a bar in one particular state. So it's important if you have certain areas where you want to live or are looking for that you actually read the rules of the specific state um, that you are considering passing the bar for or taking the bar exam. In this talk, I will focus on New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, but, um, but I think that is something for you to consider if you want to be in a different area. Again, some of the factors that you'll need to know when you're looking at the different rules are um, whether or not you come, you've had a common law degree or a civil law degree, 
whether or not you are admitted already to practice in your home country, um, or whether or not you've just completed the educational requirements to practice. So the states distinguish between those two pieces. And then sometimes where they, um, there's a criteria for being admitted to practice, there's also a criteria for how many years of practice that you've had. So again, it's, each state has its own rules. They're very specific, and it's important that if you have a certain target state in mind, that the first thing you do is to go to that state's website. This is a chart that I've put together um, from the American Bar Association document. At the bottom of the screen, you can see this information is coming from the 2016 report on foreign qualifications to sit for bars in all 50 states. This is the document that you will want to go to first as you consider um, coming to study in the United States. When I talk about the different degrees, as you can see, there's a column for any law degree. So regardless of whether you studied common law or civil law, you there are rules that would allow you to sit for the bar in all of those states. And again, I'm going to speak more specifically about Massachusetts, New York, and also Connecticut. Um, must have a common law degree. So there are some states um, that have common law requirements, and so therefore you would be able to potentially sit there if you have a common law first degree in law. And then there are other states that require you to be admitted to practice at home first. So you have to complete the educational requirements in your home country, you have to be admitted to practice, and then you can sit for the bar. We, of course, are located in New England, so we're this little state up here in the six-state region of New England. And as you can see, those are all 50 states where they have all of the rules of what you need to do. Um, we are located in Hartford, which is the center of Connecticut, and we are about an hour and a half from Boston and two hours from New York. So it's a good region where you have access uh, to many um, aspects of both reaching out to new cities, but even within the city of Hartford, you have access to a number of government organizations because we are the capital of Connecticut. And so this allows our students also to, while they're doing their LLM, have practice-based opportunities so that they can intern potentially at a company, at a firm, at a local uh, nonprofit organization, potentially work with one of our clinics on campus. So we find that we are in a great location for students to have access to that within their law degree, which, as you will hear about, in some states require certain number of volunteer hours. So let's look to what New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts require. The bar requirements in these specific states in New York and Connecticut are the most similar. Each of them requires a course in U.S. legal institutions, U.S. legal research and writing, and legal profession. The first two courses, U.S. legal institutions and U.S. legal research and writing, are both required within any LLM degree that we have for attorneys who are educated outside the United States. So those would both be required courses that you would complete anyway. In addition, you would need to complete the legal profession course, um, and that is always going to be required no matter what bar exam you sit for. After that, you would take six credits, which is typically two courses, in related bar topics. So oftentimes we refer to those as the core curriculum of the first year students, such as torts and crim and civil procedure. But there are also other options if you have different specialties. So if you were in the human rights and social justice degree, you might want to take family law as your, one of your options under those tested subjects. So you might really want to focus on constitutional law because that might be a part of your research. So again, part of what we do is work with all of our students specifically to kind of help them meet those requirements. And Connecticut essentially has the same rules as New York in terms of the course requirements, um, but you need to make sure that you're just, um, but it does also allow you in to, to do independent research. So if there was a topic that you were particularly focused on, you could do some independent research. Um, Massachusetts is slightly different in that you take constitutional law and legal profession, um, but then you pick an additional three courses. 
Um, and Massachusetts is different in that you have to be admitted in your home country, whereas in New York and Connecticut, you just have to have, to have done your degree um, in order to take that. So how do you combine these requirements for the bar also with a specialized degree program? So typically, this would require you to take additional credits. Um, the 24 credits are the degree that requirements within a specialized de degree program but you have additional requirements that would be outside of that for the bar exam. So this is why we typically say students would need 24 to 30 credits to get that whole uh, piece done. And this is why students have the option to complete this program in two or three semesters, because it allows them to spread out the 30 credits over three semesters so that you are not so um, packed and overwhelmed by the number of courses that you need to take and it really allows you to kind of uh, get a broader expansion of what you're doing within your degree. The benefit also of stretching out over three semesters is that it allows you to use some of those experiential learning opportunities so that you can get an internship in, a t in, in the city of Hartford working for the government or a company, um, or that you can do some independent research. So it allows you some more greater flexibility in how you are um, planning your courses. Now, whether or not it's 30 credits or 29 credits or 28 credits really will depend on how you plan and overlap your course requirements. And that's where I come in um, in working with each student individually to really create a program that is going to allow them to meet all of those requirements. Um, and so let me, here are a couple of sample loads for you um, in terms of insurance, institutions, if you were doing the insurance courses, how you could fit those in with the requirements. And I won't go um, through those each specifically, but it kind of allows you to see um, what the courses are and the variety of courses in those specialized degree programs. So I think the questions for you all are really trying to think about if you were going to be taking a bar exam, what kind of bar exam would you take? If you were trying to finish the degree in two or three semesters, and how would we plan that out for you? If you really want to get some of that practical training or be in one of our clinics, again, how would you plan that into meeting the requirements for the bar exam? And then when do you plan to take the bar exam? Um, what type of application paperwork needs to be done? When is that application due? So these are questions that as you're starting to plan coming to the United States for an LLM, you will want to think about. Uh, if I can just interrupt uh, very briefly uh, to both Carrie and Yan, there has been some questions and uh, to all the attendees present, uh, present here, if you do have a question, you can type it into the question panel and uh, we can ask uh, both Yan and, uh, and Carrie. So just, uh, just uh, you know, before we proceed, if, it, if it's okay for you to answer two, qu two questions that has been asked, uh, is, that, uh, is that okay? Absolutely. So, so uh, we have uh, Rohit uh, who is uh, who is currently uh, he has already done an LLM and he wants to do a second LLM. He has done a done one in corporate law and uh, uh, so he's is he asking is it still possible to do an LLM uh, from Yukon and uh, is it possible for him to qualify as a lawyer or rather eligible for him to take the uh, bar exam once uh, he, he does it, once he has completed his LLM? So if you've already taken a corporate law LLM and that's kind of where your specialization is, what uh, the best option would be to kind of enter our U.S. Legal Studies LLM program because that allows you the greatest flexibility and um, to meet the bar requirements. And you would be able to actually complete that LLM in 24 credits um, in order to do the bar requirements. And then as you go through the application process, um, Yen can you know talk to you about whether or not um, any of those credits that you received in your corporate law um, course would would necessarily qualify towards credit here in an advanced credit situation, um, but she can talk more about that. But absolutely, there are options for you here um, to take LLMs that would meet the bar requirements. Uh, there is a follow-up question by Rohit itself. Uh, it's because it's 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 uh, his marks. So the mark in uh, India or in certain other countries are based on percentage so uh, if it is uh, if it is based on percentage 
uh, is there any requirement for the LLM and uh, in the sense that uh, you know when you look at the applicants do you look at the what is the percentage of marks uh, a person has uh, to to get him, himself or herself admitted to the LLM program I think are you referring to grades for, for that's correct the grades that is exactly correct the grades but the grade is actually not uh, not like CGPA or uh, it's it's not cumulative grade point usually uh, the 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 grade is given as percentage like 50% uh, 60% like that so uh, is there a method of, of analyzing like what exactly would be the cutoff for an LLM program Yes, so uh, that's why later on I will talk about how to apply and that probably going to answer the questions. So basically, when students apply law school here in the United States, they submit the application to LSAC. So they register first and then they uh, send the transcript uh, to LSAC. LSAC will help us evaluate student transcript. So for example, in India, or in any other foreign country. They have different uh, way to great students. And LSAC has experience. They will let us know this 50% at Indian law school equal to what we have here GPA in the United States. So that will better help us better understand the student situation. And also when we do the application, uh, the mission decisions, the decision is not only based on their grade, it's based on overall package. So everything they sent to us, uh, the application information, the writing samples, the personal statement, the law, trans law school transcript, faculty, professors, or lawyer, uh, they work together, the recommendation letters, everything we evaluate. And of course, uh, for some countries that if English is not the official language, we also put that under considerations. And also for all the international students who apply our law school, we set up a Skype interview. So in that way, the student will ask any question they have that know more about our UConn law schools. And at the same time, we get to know a little bit more about the student, the applicant. So after that, the admission decision will be made. So it's overall package. It's not going to be made just, we have students ask us, oh, my GPA is only 2.7. Does that meet your admission requirement? I will say, I'm not going to make the decision just only based on the GPA. So it's an overall package. Uh, there is also one more question from Dapiksha. Dapiksha has asked me, like, uh, the, earlier you explained about uh, the, uh, the credit being 24. So you said there is a 24 credit requirement. So what is the what what does 24 credit mean? Because you know credit is a very new term to certain people who are listening. So uh, would you explain like what does that mean? Sure. Um, a typical um, credits is how we decide the length of time and effort that you put into a class. Um, and so typically each class is assigned a number of credits. So we have two credit classes, we have three credit classes, um, and that essentially means that you're in class um, for one credit hour, one hour a week for the entire semester. Um, and again, most classes are three credits or two credits. There are some that are four, but essentially what that means is that you are in class, if it's a three credit class, three hours a week, for the semester. And that's representative of the fact that you're, of the effort that you're putting into that class with the homework or the exam or the paper or whatever it is. And so it's important to know that if you are just doing any of the LLM degrees, it is a 24 credit degree. If you're in a specialized degree and want to combine that with the bar exam, you end up needing to take more than the minimum 24 credits. Um, but there are lots of options to do that. If you're solely interested in taking an LLM in order to meet the bar credits, you would typically take a more flexible approach of just going into the U.S. legal program. But the benefit of having a specialized degree plus the bar exam is it kind of allows you those enhanced credentials of a specialized degree plus the bar. 
Uh, and there is also one more question from Rohit itself, he, who had asked the question earlier. So he had he had all uh, taken the taken the English language test, which is the IELTS, uh, mm -hmm. and he has got a score of seven. But he had taken it in 2015, and is it still valid if he were to apply for this year? And that is the application open for this year? So that means, like for 2017 entry, is it possible to apply right now? Yes, it's possible because for IELTS that score is going to be good for two years. So even uh, our fall admissions still open, and the deadline is June 15. So if he could get everything I listed here for the application materials ready before June 16, June 15, <laughs> we still have time to process and uh, make the admission decision. If he missed the deadline of June 15, at the Yukon Law School, we do two terms, so spring and the fall. So in that case, if he missed the fall or missed the June 15 deadline, he can submit his applications and apply for spring semesters. So the application deadline for spring semester, which start in January, the deadline for application is November 15. So if he could beat the deadline, I believe his IL score should be okay for this year. Thank you, Yan, and sorry to interrupt because there were a lot of questions that was coming in. So if there is any further question, then we'll ask uh, towards the end of the presentation. So anyone who have any question can type it out over here, and once the presentation is over, we will be asking uh, Yan the, uh, the question. Thank you, Yan. I'll, I'll let you continue right now. Thank you. You're welcome. And just, you know, just to give you all a sense of, of what types of classes that you can put into your LLM, we have lecture classes, which is the picture that you're seeing now, which tends to be um, 45 to 50 people. Our largest classroom fits about 70 students, so you're never going to have a class with more than 70 students, and typically we're in the 35 to 50 range for a lecture class. They're still quite small and you really have that personal contact with the professor who will have weekly office hours and you'll really get a chance to develop your academics through com um, working closely with faculty members. Seminars are classes that have 18 students or less and this is typically a class where you would be uh, working with the material, you might be doing a research paper, you might be working in small groups with your fellow students and our LLM students have the unique position where they are sitting directly with and in the class with USJD students. So in our classrooms it really is allowing you to kind of meet US law students as well and you're really kind of forming connections that can help you build your career. We also have clinics and independent research. Clinics are where you represent clients so we actually have clients that come into the law school for intellectual property, um, for housing issues, for human rights and asylum issues. And those cases you would work directly to represent them in the courts or in other areas of law. And of course if you have a research interest you can find a professor to work directly with you. And again, I'm one of the counselors available at the school. I spend a lot of time focused on helping LLM students really create the program that's best for them. What are the classes you need? What are the classes you want? What's going to be most beneficial to you in your career? Which bar exam are you focused on? What are the rules? How can we make sure that you are completing those requirements and getting everything you need here at UConn Law? So we just talked about the LM application process and um, the, well, one of the things I just want to point out, we talk about specialized LM program here today, but actually at the Yukon School of Law, we have five LM programs. We do have a U.S. legal studies. That's very popular among all the international students. So if your plan, your goal is just simply come to the United States, uh, get a degree of LLM, then take bar. So we, we probably would suggest you just do U.S. legal studies. But if you would like to focus on one of the subject areas, specialized program is the way to go. And at the UConn School of Law, we're very proud that we have four best programs that we can offer here at the UConn School of Law. For example, our insurance law program is the best in the country, ranked number one. And the other three programs, human rights, 
um, intellectual property, energy and environmental law are also ranked pretty high and supported by best faculties we have and also Carrie mentioned that we offer hands-on exercise, we offer externship and legal clinics. So that's the way that you can learn a lot. Um, anyway, so let me talk a little bit about application process. So if you go to our web page, law.ucon.edu slash admissions and follow the um, instructions, we have all the links there and you can choose which program you like and click and you will get more information about different specialized programs. We do rolling admission for both spring and the fall enrollment. I just mentioned for fall, the application deadline for international student is June 15, and for the spring enrollment, the application deadline is November 15. So if you are planning to apply UConn Law School, you may just apply through LSAC. You register there, and then you send the following application materials to them and so that once they have all the uh, uh, your application documents ready, we're going to review it and we're going to interview it, you through Skype and then we're going to make very quick admission decisions. Uh, if you have any questions about any of those application documents, you can ask me questions later. Um, we do require have language requirement. So if your official language or the language used at your law, sc at law school or higher uh, institution is not English, then you have to do either TOEFL or IELTS. And basically here is the TOEFL school or IELTS school we required. Um, you can take a look and um, that will help you to make the decisions. Some of the time a student's TOEFL score or L score probably not meet our requirement. For example, you're below 80 or your L score is below 6.0. We do conditional acceptance. And um, the only catch here is if you want to study English and want to improve your English, we will put you at our language school for one semester. Once you pass the language school evaluations and get the certificate, you can transfer to UConn School of Law. And do you have any? Well, we also have PTE, which is Pearson's oh, testing. Right. So we did actually recently, we have not updated our slides, but we did recently add Pearson's testing score as well. So if that's a language test that's more accessible to you, you could take that as well. It's called PTE, and the requirements are also set on our website. So we do have except, uh, exemptions, and for example, as I just mentioned, your official language is English, or you already got a uh, LM degree or a degree in foreign countries, or you studied and work in foreign country, English-speaking country for over two years, those are can be considered, then you don't need to take TOEFL uh, IELTS language test. But if you have any questions regarding the language requirement, feel free to get in touch with us and we can explain. At the UConn School of Law, we do um, have a program that allowing LM students transfer to JD. So as we all understand, more and more foreign students, they want to come to the United States and study a JD degree. The only um, problem or difficulty they have is take a set. And for some reason, foreign students, they may feel that's pretty challenging to get a good score of LASET. So if that's a problem, and then probably LM transfer to JD is a way to, to go. Basically, you come to our law school, get an LM degree. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if your GPA is B or 3.0 above with the recommendation letters, you can transfer, apply to JD, and then transfer to JD. Yeah. The only other um, <coughs> part of that program is, is also that you would take one of the first year courses when you get here. But again, we kind of counsel you through that. And you can apply through the, to the LLM if you're interested in transferring to the JD program without having to take the LSAT or the LSAT. And then the benefit of that is that your credits that you earn uh, in your LLM degree, 20 of them, 
or more, depending on how many you took, could be able to be transferred into the JD program so that it would take you less time and less money, essentially, to complete your JD program. Um, so that is an option that some, some students decide to, to um, partake. We also have scholarships available for our international students within our LLM programs. Um, we have a dean scholarship, which we give out. Again, uh, Yen really stressed, and we feel strongly that we look at the whole application and, and that all um, aspects of the student. And so we do have a dean scholarship that is given out at the time of application. Um, we have an Anthony Smith's Endowed Scholarship for students particularly in our US Legal uh, Studies program. And then the Merit Scholarship program is something that we've established specifically for those students who are interested in the specialized LLM programs and also completing the bar requirements. Because as we said, students in this situation often end up going over 24 credits. And because it's, the cost of the program is based on how many credits you, could, you take, this has an added financial burden. And so the Merit Scholarship Program is established for students to apply to that once they realize and understand that they will be going over the 24 credits. Okay, so I used to be a librarian, so I'm so proud that we have one of the most beautiful libraries in the country. And um, the library has hundreds of databases that are offered to students to use, and this is the inside picture of the library. We always ask our international students, where is your favorite space, uh, place on campus, almost everyone answers the library. So the library has enough seating for every student we have at the law school, and this is always a place that students find that they feel so comfortable to stay. So a lot of the time, always we'll have international students ask us what the campus <coughs> looks like. And we're very happy and very proud that we have the most beautiful campus, a uh, law school campus in the country. Um, as you can see, that we have some <coughs> some historic. <laughs> we have historic buildings. Sorry, Jens, I have a little it's cough this coffee. morning. It's it's um. So we have many historic <laughs> buildings here, um, and the students often describe our campus as being colorful and green and just amazing and beautiful. Um, and so. These buildings are where your classes are. These buildings are where you study. These buildings are where you meet with the professors and the deans. And here you see it blooming in spring. And here you see it kind of in winter time when it's cold, um, when students can play and make, you know, in the snow and experience something different at UConn. So if you really want to hear directly what our students are saying about us and about their experiences here at UConn, this is um, a lovely way, an easy way to do this, is really to go to our YouTube channel for UConn Law School, and you'll be able to kind of hear the voices of our current students and talking about it. And again, now we will answer questions. Um, but if you have this, Yen and I will answer questions for you that have come through. Um, but if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, on email, and we can kind of help you plan what your education could look like at UConn Law. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, Carrie. So uh, uh, <clears throat> there is a, a, um, a question from Rajshri. Uh, actually, there are three questions from her. So she asks about the fi financial aid, but you have already covered about the financial aid. Uh, if you'd like to add something more, then uh, please go ahead. And also she asked about what is the, how do you decide on uh, the financial aid? Is it need-based or is it based on the marks or do they, uh, everyone who applies to it, are they all automatically considered for the financial aid? How do you decide on that? Sure. Well, one important thing that Yen and I actually didn't talk about is really um, that as a state institution, uh, we're one of the most affordable LLM programs. Um, so each credit right now, depending on what your program is, is either $1,190 per credit or $1,266 per credit. Um, and so those make your uh, 24 credit tuition costs come in around 
28,000 to 32,000, depending on which program you are enrolled in. So we're really one of the most affordable LLM programs, and we really uh, we pride ourselves on being affordable for students. Um, in terms of financial aid package, we are not need-based program um, because because the fees that come into our program allow us to manage and have the programs and bring in adjunct professors and have the staff for you to do career services and everything we do. We finance our programs through the fees that we get from our students. Um, and so we work um, to really provide the best programming possible for students with those fees. If students are interested in, we typically, again, look at them holistically and provide scholarship based on their entire application and everyone is eligible. If a student has a unique need um, that might be a greater challenge than other students, um, they could, of course, write a separate letter request within the application, but each student is really evaluated on those application materials um, in order to uh, make it fair and equitable um, and accessible to all students and make sure that we are equitably applying our um, scholarships across the academic program. Uh, and uh, there is also another question from Radhsri itself. Uh, she had asked that like, she is currently in her final year and she has one more semester left uh, which she will be uh, done with by August this year. Will, I, will she call, qualify for the spring application process? That's what uh, she asked. Yes, she would. Um, and she, depending, I mean, she could also apply for the fall start if she's going to complete her program in August prior to when we start. So, um, you know, we have an end of August start. So if she felt like she was going to have enough time to uh, finish her degree and then um, start in end of August here at UConn Law, she would actually be able to do that. She would just have to make sure she can give us her degree um, when, you know, when she finishes. Or she'd also have the opportunity um, to start in January. So if that is the case, then uh, say, say for example, uh, 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 but even though she finished with her course in August, she would not be uh, in position of the degree or of uh, getting the final mark list by August. So w w how do you decide like, okay, this person would qualify? Uh, is there a pr procedure for that? And uh, I mean, I'm not saying that she would uh, be having any issues, but then in case if someone is not able to uh, uh, you know, uh, if someone fails the final exam or something like this, then what happens once they start studying? Part of that will depends on what the process is on your end. So again, it kind of depends on when she would take exams in August and when she's expecting to see the results. Um, so that's probably a little bit more of a complicated question and answer, um, but one that where we, we could work directly with the student to kind of understand. Because if she's not taking all of her exams, until the end of August, she might not be able to start here in a timely fashion anyway. Um, so it's definitely something that we could probably discuss with her directly. It's a little bit, uh, there's not a clear answer uh, for you. All right. Uh, and in terms of the scholarship, uh, what percentage is normally covered by the uh, three scholarship that you mentioned uh, in terms of the, uh, of, the, of the scholarship, like what percentage of the fees or uh, living expense or uh, what uh, is covered by the scholarship? I mean, I think scholarships can range from 1,000 to 10,000 depending on the quality of the student application. And one other uh, thing which uh, is uh, missing, uh, or rather, which which you probably missed to uh, explain, is uh, the the cost of living uh, of uh, in in uh, in uh, University of Connecticut. Like, what is a, a typical student uh, expected to budget in terms of an annual cost of living? Absolutely. I mean, I think that we we have actually an itemized list on our website. Um, for students who are interested in a, in a budget that kind of breaks down everything from housing to books to travel and includes all of those different um, pieces. Typically students rent for anywhere from $500 to $700 a month um, and that will depend on if they're living in a group situation or living on their own. It's more expensive to live in your own apartment. Um, 
and then students have their own kind of costs for food. Um, so a full budget is on our on our website, and it's probably easier than me trying to kind of recap that. Um, but we also too sometimes um, we don't give scholarships for living expenses. We can give scholarships for your tuition expenses. So it is important that students look at that information. So basically here in Connecticut, comparing to big cities, our living expenses, relatively speaking, is, is much lower. Yeah, much more affordable. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Carrie. So if there is any further question, then please feel free to type it over here and I, would, I, I can ask them uh, if, if you do have any question to the attendees. While they're typing it out, while they type out the question, uh, I had one uh, further question as well. In terms of the class size for, uh, for the LLM, what is the typical class size uh, in, in, in terms of uh, an LLM class? We actually, uh, just Kerry mentioned that basic, typically here in, uh, on our campus, the class size is about 30. Depends on if it's a seminar class, it's probably 12 to 20 students. If it's like a popular class, like contract, torts, it might be, might be between 50 to 75 students. One good thing about our law school's LM program is all our LM students, international students, they actually choose classes together with JD students, which means they sit in the same classroom with JD students. And we admit a total of 30 to 50 LLM students each year. Um, so again, it's a smaller cohort. They know all of their LLM classmates and really have a chance to connect within that LLM cohort, but also within the JD community. We're one so, uh, Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, so if, if uh, they take the class with the JD students, so the number of JD students might be, uh, let's say, if it is slightly higher than the LM students. So each class, when they are taking, will it be um, JD plus the LLM students? So that the class size might be anywhere between uh, 50 to 100. Uh, is, that, is that correct to uh, assume that? Our maximum class size would be 70. That's the biggest class. Oh, that's the biggest. Class okay. is 70 mm -hmm. students. So, but that 70 students could be, you know, 50 USJD students and 15 LOMs, depending on the topic. Thank you so much. So, uh, I, if there, there is, I, uh, there is one question uh, from uh, from uh, Sup Suprovo. If I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. So, uh, uh, Suprovo asked, like, how many years course is this, or how many months course is this? I think he joined in a little bit later. But uh, if you if you can entertain this question, uh, how many years course is the LLM program? So typically the LLM program would take two, two or three semesters. So if you wanted to finish um, in, if you started in September, August, you could finish in May. If you start in January, you typically finish in December because you have the summer break in between. Um, if you take it in three semesters, if you start in August, you'd finish in December. Or if you started in January, you would finish in May of the next year. So it really depends on how you plan your program and what length of the time uh, you want to complete your degree in. Thank you, Gary. So uh, I think that's about it with the questions. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for taking the time out to explain about the LLM uh, pro process as well as uh, qualifying uh, or rather taking the taking the various bar exams. Uh, so if you have anything further to add, you may please do so right now. Or else, you know, thank you so much for uh, for taking this time to to explain the LLM uh, application process. I do want to add one more thing is because you asked for class size. And um, at the UConn School of Law, we have small class, and we have a lot of faculty to support those class. So basically, here at the UConn School of yes, Law, sorry, students get lots of attention from our faculty, yes. which is really good because when you can um, have a conversation with faculty, and at the time you are starting job okay, hunting, can faculty can write a very good recommendation for you. 
and also for any scholarly um, yep. discussion with our faculty, mm -hmm. students benefit a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's and one of the strengths we have at the UConn School that's of Law. Right. Okay. Students okay. get a lot of attention from our faculty. Thanks, Thank so, you, Yen. Sure. Anytime if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to get in touch with me. And if you plan to apply our UConn School of Law, and send me an email and let me know, and uh, we can always help you. Thank you, and thank you once again for joining. Thank you, Yan. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us and taking the time out to explain the process. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thanks. having us. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye.